regrades you have until the end of the quarter to turn in or to like submit them and but like along with that don't expect them to always be answered like right away um, we will get to them all um, so yeah if you submit it and if and it hasn't been responded to yet but it, like it's still open um, we will get to it or the grader will get to it eventually um, if you are struggling or not doing as well as you wanted to uh, I mean it's always a good time to reach out for help but now is a great time um, as we still have a couple quizzes left um, and the best ways to do that are definitely office hours and if you just feel kind of lost or you need some more individual attention reach out to your TAs or reach out to me um, or the lead TA anybody and we can help kind of get you set up with a system that works for you yeah I thought it was next. I, okay, yeah, the calendar's right. So the 23rd, I guess. So that is not next week. Sorry, yeah, sorry about that. The calendar's up though. So you, ha you have the document. That is, yeah, we'll stick with that. Um, yeah, any other like logistics questions, stuff like that? In that case, let's get into the material. So we'll start with a bit of review from last time. And by the way, like this whole lecture, except like the very end stuff, should be pretty much review. We're just going to go into some details and like spe special cases and stuff like that. Um, but forces, they're vector quantity. Units are newtons. They're like pushes and pulls. Um, and what they do are change the motion of an object. So if an object has constant motion or constant momentum, then you don't need a force to maintain that. But if it's speeding up, slowing down, or turning, then you need a net force to do that. And it's net force because you could have as many forces as you want acting on an object, but if they sum to zero, then it experiences no net force. Um, and yeah, if there is a net force, its motion will change. What do we mean by motion? Well, momentum is the quantity we use to describe that. It's also a vector, uh, points in the same direction as velocity, and in fact, it's just equal to velocity multiplied by the mass, because we know that objects that are heavier have more momentum, even if they're moving at the same speed as lighter objects. So momentum is like kind of inertia, if you want to think of it um, like that. Uh, and the way that forces change momentum uh, are, is this equation here. So just looking at these two first terms, delta P equals F net delta T. Simple equation, but there's a lot of information in here. First of all, delta P and F net are both vectors, and so and on this side, we just have a vector multiplied by delta t, which is just a, a scalar, like a number. And so f net and delta p point in the same direction. And that's always going to be true if we just have like some vector equals another vector times some scalar, like delta t or mass or something like that, um, that they point in the same direction. If you have one vector equals the sum of a bunch of vectors, then we need to do more work to determine what direction that is. Um, but like delta p and f point in the same direction also means Momentum and velocity, we know those also point in the same direction, right? Because all m does to velocity is change the units, but just stretch the arrow. It doesn't change the direction of it. Um, right, so f net times delta t. Delta t is important because, you know, the longer I apply a force, the more impulse I'm going to transfer into an object, which kind of illuminates why we even have this quantity here, j net, which is the same thing. I mean, you can solve problems without j net. You just do F net delta T, that gives you your delta P, great. The reason we have impulse is really just like a vocabulary word. It's easier to talk about. Like I just said, if I apply a force for a longer amount of time, I deliver more impulse. That's one way to say it. I could also just skip this part and say, if I apply a force for a longer amount of time, I cause a greater change in momentum. But those two things are synonymous. It's just kind of this like intermediate quantity. You never have to like, work with it if you don't want to, but if I say like impulse on a quiz or example, like, you should know what we are talking about. And it's just the same kilogram meters per second. Um, right. So uh, a little bit more about momentum. Um, an object can still have it without a net force being applied to it. Remember the net force gives us a delta P, not just the momentum. An object can have whatever momentum we want. It can be stationary, it can be moving at the speed of light. Um, but if a momentum is constant, we know the F net is zero. Uh, and then also we can talk about the momentum of a whole system by just adding up the momenta of each individual object. Uh, and that's just the sum of vectors. So like this vector equation, P total is not necessarily in the same direction as P1 or P2 
right? It's in some new direction defined by us adding those vectors, whatever they added, are added together. So in that case, we can't instantly tell. Um, and systems can be closed or open, just meaning that I draw, like I define my system saying this is included, this is included, and this is not included, right? And any f interaction between things that are included in our system are not a net force, right? Those are all going to, as we'll see, kind of, they can exchange momentum. Those forces will always be equal and opposite and cancel out. But if something happens that's a result of an object outside of our system, like often gravity, like if the gravity pulls on something, we don't consider the Earth as part of our system. And so gravity we think of as an external force. Or wind is another one. We often, like, you might see, like, wind pushing a sailboat. And we would consider that an external force because we don't normally consider, like, the air, the atmosphere, as part of our system. We could, and if we did include it, then there would be no net force, and you'd see an equal and opposite momentum transfer between the sail sailboat and the wind. We'll see specific examples of that. But, um, yeah, the way you define your system can affect whether or not there is a net force. And there's nothing, spe or there's nothing special about, like, a net external force. It's just, again... Same force as everything else, except it's just happening by something outside of the system to something inside the system. And the same equation applies for the total change in momentum. We have the total net external force, that's redundant, the net external force times delta t gives us the total change in momentum. So that would, the total change in momentum would be like delta p1 plus delta p2 plus delta p3. Um, all right, let's do an example of just applying a couple forces to an object. We have a three kilogram, three kilogram box here. I first apply F1 to it, which is moving to the right. We get an X component, and then I, and that's for two seconds. Then I apply F2, which is pointing down, has a negative Y component. That for three seconds, and I want to know what the final velocity of the object is, the magnitude and direction, assuming it started at rest. So let's do it like conceptually first, using a momentum chart. Our P initial is zero because the object is initially at rest. Now. For my delta p, I'm going to put both forces in here, even though they happen consecutively, like one and then the other. I'm going to put them both kind of happening, the impulse as a result of them as a, happening at the same time, because we can think of this delta p column as just everything that happens between our initial snapshot and our final snapshot, right? Just like in a, when we were doing spatial like circuits, we have like our initial, final. The delta is between those two, and so anything that happens in between is what causes that delta. Same kind of thing happens here where we have a snapshot. This is like t equals zero. Here's another snapshot. Let's say after five seconds, once both of these forces are done acting, and so anything that happens between zero and five seconds, we, would, we can just toss in our delta p box. And so I can put the, both forces in there, where I have f1 pointing to the right, f2 pointing down, and these aren't just the forces, right? This is the delta P as a result of these forces. So I didn't draw it to scale, but this should be like F1 times delta T1, and this would be F2 times delta P2. And so we get our total change in momentum or our total impulse delivered throughout that delta P interval. And just reiterating, this delta P is in the same direction as F net, right? So if one force points to the right, the other points down, it makes sense that our net force points to the right and down, and as a result, our object moves to the right and down. All right, so uh, yeah, P initial is zero, delta P, so P final is just whatever equal, whatever uh, that delta P is equal to. Uh, so let's turn that momentum chart into some equations, and that equation is basically just that our P final, or, and our, we can find our final velocity from that, is equal to whatever the impulse delivered by these forces was. So just F net times delta T. Anytime we see a vector equation like these two here, just like a vector equals a vector, a sum of vectors, we can break that into components, right? And we probably should, because we can't really algebraically work with equations like this. So we can break it into its X and Y, simply by getting rid of the vector sign and making two of them, one with the subscript X, one with Y. And now we can start plugging in values, which we have. So uh, given the F net, which has these two components, it's kind of weird to write them like this because they act for different amounts of time, but just so we can see that they're neatly divided into an X and a Y, let's go for delta P X first. So 
delta px is just going to be f net x times delta t. We have three newtons times c seconds. We get six kilogram meters per second. And now this is a whole long list of things just to say that since we started with zero and we added the six kilogram meters per second, we're going to wind up with six kilogram meters per second as our final momentum. But explicitly, we're saying p final is p initial plus delta p, zero plus delta p. So that was just to be extra explicit. And then finally, we know momentum is mass times velocity. So to find the velocity, we can just divide by the mass, three kilograms, and we get the final velocity in the x direction is two meters per second. So the x component of the velocity, the piece that's moving to the right, is two meters per second. Now, completely independently of this, we can do the y direction. Now our f net is negative four newtons in the y direction, because we're pointing down. This force applies for three seconds instead of two, and I get a new impulse of negative 12 kilogram meters per second in the negative y direction. Same thing, we start with zero, so negative 12 is also our final momentum, and then we can divide by the mass and get that our final velocity in the y direction is negative four meters per second. So now we have our components of our v final, two and negative four, meaning again, the object is moving to the right and down, a bit faster down than it is to the right. And so if we wanna find the magnitude and direction, we need to do some trig. So I always recommend, even if we weren't given this picture here, I would recommend like at least drawing this triangle just to show that I have a positive x component and a negative y component, and then drawing my v final vector. And this makes it a lot easier, at least for me, to do the trig that I need to do. So to find the magnitude, we know that's just the Pythagorean theorem, right? The x component squared plus the y component squared, square root of that, and we get a magnitude of 4.47 meters per second. So that's, how, that's the speed of the object. And now to describe the direction, the angle I've labeled here, which was just a choice, you could do this a different way, but I chose to describe this angle between v final and the positive x-axis. And so to find this one, my opposite of theta is v1y, and my adjacent is v1x. So I would do inverse tan, or tan theta is equal to v1y, four newtons, or sorry, four meters per second, over v1x, which is two. So I use four here instead of negative four, and you'll always really see this in examples we do. Whenever we're plugging into like trig functions and stuff, we always use the magnitude of the components. Now you can use positive and negative numbers. However, it gets tricky really quickly because trig functions all assume you're starting at angle zero, which is the positive, y ax the positive x axis and then rotating counterclockwise this way. And so here like this, if I plugged in a positive x and a negative y, I think this tangent would give me a negative theta because it's going like opposite. So I don't know. If, if all of that is fresh in your mind from Algebra 2 or whenever we learn that, go for it, that's great. But I highly recommend to just use like drawings and positive numbers instead. Just like draw the triangle and label the angle you're talking about. Um, I think that is a much easier way to avoid errors. So in this case, it's just a triangle with side lengths four and two. We get this angle is 63.4 degrees and I've described it as south of east because we're east and then we're going south to get to V final. I could have also labeled this angle, the angle between the negative y axis and V final. In this case, I flipped the values in tangent because now my opposite is V1x, my adjacent is V1y, and so I get 90 minus whatever I got before, uh, and this would be east of south. Both of these are equally correct, and you could do it a bunch of different ways too. You could say this, like I said before, to the right, of the negative y axis or counterclockwise from negative y, however you want to do it. Yeah? Say that again? So if, if what was changed? Yeah, exactly. So you could do it that way, or you could also just find the net force in the y direction first, which would be like one plus negative four is negative three, and then use that. Um, but it, yeah, so you can always, 
when you're doing these problems, you can always find F net first and then multiply F net delta T and get your change in momentum, or you can like write it out explicitly in like F1 delta T plus F2 delta T plus F3 delta T. Those are the same thing. If you like factor out the delta T, you could just simplify it to F net anyway. So the order, like when you combine them um, is up to you. Uh, all right, let's do a bit of a tricky clicker question. We have a ball that has an, with a firecracker inside it that's initially moving in the positive y direction. Firecracker explodes and we're left with three separate parts. And so these arrows are all momentum vectors. And so which of these does not conserve momentum? Which of these final states does not conserve momentum? In other words, is not possible. So I encourage you to think about it for a sec and then talk to your neighbors. Maybe even divide and conquer. See if you know, some people can try to eliminate or confirm some options, other people can try others. Also, this water is empty, and I guarantee I'm going to try to drink from it again, so watch out for that. We're pretty split so far. Every answer except C has votes. Oh, now someone's giving some love to see. I'll give you 15 more seconds. All right, let's, let's walk through these together. So first of all, when I say conservation of momentum, or like momentum is conserved, what am I looking for? So, like, so when you were looking to see if momentum is conserved, what are you comparing here? The momentum of the sum of all energy distributed to a given momentum of the large energy. Yeah, so the sum of whatever three arrows we have over here should give us this, because conservation of momentum just means that P initial equals p final. And so we have to sum them to get p final. So let's try to do that real quick. We'll start with A. So in A, we have these two bottom pieces that are going left and right, which right away that's a red flag for me because our initial momentum just has a y component, right? So it's a positive y, there's no x. However, since we have two that are going in opposite directions, if we add those two together, they're gonna cancel. And we're just left with this single one up top, which I mean, maybe the scale's a little bit off, but that could easily match this one. So that one, that one looks reasonable to me. Let's take a look at C, very similar to A, except now these two bottom ones are tilted up a little bit. So the x direction still takes care of itself. The one on the left goes just as far left as the one on the right goes right, and so the x components will cancel. And now what we're left with is they both go up a little bit, and then the top one also goes up a little bit. So we're left with three pieces that go up in the y direction just a little bit, which could very well add up to a bigger arrow that goes up in the y direction. So that one's good. Uh, D, that one's even easier than C. That's, it's like we took the first step and already canceled out the x direction for those two. So in D, we just have three vertical arrows, small ones, that could add up to a big one. So that, that works out. And how about E? So E, it gets a little bit trickier. So x direction, same deal. This one goes to the left, this one goes to the right. And the amount at which they do that, the magnitude in the x direction is like equal and opposite. So the x cancels, we're, we're good. Now we just have to check the y. If we look, they all, all three of these vectors have the same y magnitude. So they all like traverse from top to bottom the same distance. And we have one that's pointing up on the left, 
one that's pointing down in the middle, and one that's pointing up on the right. So two up, one down. If we add those together, we're left with a net of one up. So yeah, that works out too. We are left with a net of one big vector pointing straight up. And finally, the answer, since all the other ones worked, is B, which we can check. It's a very similar situation to E, where all of these have, well, first the X cancels out from the two bottom ones. And then now instead of having two up and one down, we have two down and, and one up. So we're left with a net of one pointing down. So the net momentum in there is not, cannot be equal to the net momentum in our initial setup. So momentum is conserved there. Yeah. Nope, so you can, s it's, it's interesting, we'll, and we'll talk about energy a little bit later on. So it can certainly add kinetic energy, um, but yeah, momentum, there's like, there's nothing, momentum, you can't just like create momentum anyway. So if you're in space and you have a jetpack on or something, you're like floating there, the reason you can use that to shoot off into space is because like the, what you saw with the rocket ship in DL, it has to spew fuel or like exhaust in one direction in order to counter it. Um, yeah, otherwise nothing would happen. Okay, so questions on this one? Let's do a quantitative example. So this one's gonna be in 1D only. So we're moving toward two dimensions. I mean, we've already done some two dimensional stuff, but this one's just in one dimension. Um, but we've seen that X and Y are completely independent, right? You might have to do the first step of breaking something down into components or the last step of turning those components into a magnitude and direction, but the middle steps are all the same. Okay, so um, I ruined some quizzes by spilling my evening quart of chocolate milk all over them, and uh, so I had to give the students zeros. I suppose I was a little cranky considering I didn't get the milk. Uh, anyway, I'm rollerblading the class the next day to burn off the quart of chocolate milk that I normally consume. <laughs> And uh, I'm adding little details every lecture, and I think I'm getting quite good at it. Uh, all right, so I'm moving five meters per second in the positive x direction, and so students throw three eggs at me in the negative x. So they're moving much faster, right? I'm moving five meters per second. The eggs are moving with opposite direction but have a higher velocity, uh, but they're also much lighter, right? I weigh 60 kilograms, and the eggs weigh a quarter of a kilogram. And so the question here is how much do the eggs slow me down? after the collision. Um, so first I wanna define my system. We don't normally write this down, but it's not a bad thing to do if you want. Um, but I'm gonna say that both me and the eggs are included in the system. So the egg, the momentum transfer occurs between me and the eggs. They are not an external force. So there's no net external force here. Um, I guess I didn't write it out, but we'll assume there's no friction or air resistance or anything like that. So it's just a collision between me and the eggs, yeah. Yeah, I would, if, if they're there, I would tell you. Um, it would probably be up to you to say like, oh, that's an external force. Um, again, because do you care about the change in momentum of the ground due to the friction? Like the, the ground gives you some net force in one direction slowing you down from the friction. And by conservation of momentum, you indeed do transfer some momentum into the earth below, but it's, you know, we can't even measure that and we don't care about it. So it's much easier to just think of that as an external force. Okay, um, so no external force, meaning our total change in momentum is zero, that all the momentum changes that occur will be like X changes between pieces of our system. Um, so why don't we go ahead and make a momentum chart. Oh, also one more thing I wanted to say, a common like hang up that people might reach is that like I mentioned that the students threw the eggs. Right, so that at least leads my brain sometimes to think like, oh, there's a, like, is that an external force that's happening? Like, they apply force to the eggs, like, did that? And the answer is, it could be, but, so like, when we set up our momentum chart, our initial here is while the eggs are in the air coming toward me and I'm moving toward them, and the final is after the collision. So the time when the students are throwing the eggs is before our initial Right, we're starting the clock once the eggs are in the air. That's our starting point, and so we don't include that. Um, and that's why we don't include the force from the student throwing the eggs. 
if we wanted to separately work that equation out, then we could think like, oh, the student throw, let's put them on rollerblades too, why not? The student throws the egg, then they would have some momentum transferred to the egg, they would rebound in the other direction after they threw it, right? We've seen stuff like that, but that's a separate scenario. We're just talking about collision between me and the egg. Okay, first thing, I'm gonna put my total change in momentum as zero because we found, or we know that the net force here, net external force is zero. And now we can fill in my P initial column uh, because we're given the initial values. We can just calculate that. So my initial speed is five meters per second, and that's to the right, and I weigh 60 kilograms, so I'm just gonna draw this arrow here. It's kind of arbitrary to start with, but I drew a long arrow for me. And now the eggs, they are moving a lot faster, 20 meters per second instead of five meters per second, uh, but the eggs weigh a quarter of a kilogram, whereas I weigh 60 kilograms. So their momentum vector should still be quite small compared to mine, and of course moving in the opposite direction. Um, so yeah, when we're doing these charts, the relative scale is important, but like being exact isn't, isn't super important, just as long as my vector is much bigger than the eggs. And then for the total, we just add them together, and we'll get some vector still pointing to the right, but that's a little bit shorter than my initial momentum. Uh, okay, and that's as far as we can push with just the values that we are given here. Uh, so, well, I guess there's one more thing, actually. We know our total initial momentum. We know our total change is zero, right? So whatever momentum I start with, I have to end with, right? So the total momentum is the same. We just don't know. We have to figure out now how it's going to be split up between me and the eggs. And so the key thing here, well, let me ask you, what, what am I missing? So I said, like, we used all the quantities that are given here, or like, you know, implicitly in the length of our arrows. We know everything we, that we used about the initial scenario. What's something about the final scenario that I can use to keep pushing forward? Yeah? We don't know that they stop moving, but you're super close. Something about the eggs. Exactly, yeah. So s compared to me, they're not moving anymore. They, they stick to me. And so this is something that you're gonna have to identify in probably a bunch of problems. When things collide and stick together, a key, like the quantitative thing that you need to pick up is that their V final is now the same because you know they're attached, so they have the same final velocity. So here I've just written out the expression for my final momentum and the egg's final momentum. We of course have different masses, but there's just this single value for Vf. I guess the information I could have given us to make this obvious is that the eggs are raw. If they were hard boiled, perhaps they wouldn't stick to me. Uh, but anyway, we have that the V finals are the same, and we actually need that to solve the problem. Um, and just as a little guide, this isn't really like a step that we would need to solve it, but if I wanted to take the ratio of these two final momenta, because I'm gonna be drawing the arrows in my chart, just to see, I can do my momentum divided by the eggs. Since we have the same V final, that cancels out, and that's just equal to the ratio of our masses. I can just multiply the eggs mass by three, and I get 80, so my momentum is 80 times bigger than the eggs. And so that just instructs me that on when I fill in my momentum chart, that whatever arrow I put for me is going to be a lot bigger than the one that I put for the eggs, because we're moving at the same velocity, but my mass is a lot bigger, kind of same argument we made before. Um, also, I guess I didn't mention this before, but I, I mean, it's written here. I combined the three eggs into a single row in the momentum chart. You could easily have made three columns here and made just like a, it would just be copy pasting the same thing in each one and each arrow would be one third the length of this and we would get the same total. But in reality, there'd be no difference in calculating those three individually or just multiplying everything we do here by three or just like a single egg that weighs 0.75 kilograms, uh, maybe an ostrich egg. So now we know uh, that these have the same velocity. We know my momentum arrow is much bigger than this momentum arrow. And the last thing, the direction, maybe it's obvious from just like intuitively, I, if I'm moving forward and I got hit with eggs, I would still probably be moving forward. So another way to see that like explicitly is that this is our final momentum arrow and we have to have two arrows that add up to it that are pointing in the same direction. And the only way that's possible is if both of these do point also to the right. 
right? So we know mine is whatever, and this one has to be a lot smaller than it, and these two have to add up to this one. If, there was, if these, either of these was pointing in any other direction, then they'd both have to be pointing in that direction because we know they're, they have the same velocity. And if these weren't pointing in the exact same direction as this, they couldn't add up to it. So I don't know how many ways to put that, but there's, we very explicitly proved that this has to be true. Now we're just left with the delta p column. For me, I have, so the total momenta are the same, initial and final, right? Initially, it's my momentum minus a little bit equals that value. And in the final case, it's my momentum plus a little bit equals that value. So we know that my momentum has to shrink a little bit, right? So my delta p is some small amount that's negative. And now we have two ways to solve for this remaining delta p for the eggs. I can either say, well, my delta p was this little bit negative, and so to get to zero, I need the three eggs to be equal and opposite that. Or I could also say, well, the eggs were moving to the left. They had some momentum to the left. And then finally, they have some small momentum to the right. And so the change needs to be to the right to like cancel out the initial and give some extra to the right final. So here's a momentum chart describes everything that's happening. Now we can use it to write down the equations that will give us the solution. So first, let's, again, do what we know, which is the p initial column. We have all the numbers for that. So that column, just reading it off like an equation, is my initial momentum plus the egg's initial momentum is the total initial momentum. I have all those values, my mass and velocity, the egg's mass and their velocity, and I get this initial total momentum of 285 kilograms, meters times meters per second. Now, why don't we just follow the same order of our operations I used to fill out the momentum chart. The bottom row now, just the p initial is this, and my delta p is zero. My p initial and p final have to be the same thing. So my p final is also this 285 kilogram meters per second. And then lastly, I can connect it to p final is equal to the sum of my final momentum plus the egg's final momentum. I don't know what their final velocity and my final velocity are, but I know it's the same. Right, I know it's this one value v final because we're stuck together. And now this equation only has one unknown. And so I can solve for v final and get whatever, 4.69 meters per second, which is a little bit slower than the original five meters per second that I was moving. This middle line here where I wrote 285, I'm holding the water bottle, but I didn't try to drink from it. 285 kilogram meters per second divided by m total. That's, again, just a step I added for clarity. It's not something you would actually have to do. But it was just to emphasize that in solving this, we found that our final velocity is really just equal to like finding our total momentum that stays the same the whole time and dividing it by the mass of this now combined object. That is me and the three eggs. That weighs 60.75 kilograms. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If the eggs like hit me and then drop to the ground with no, like they, they stopped, then, then yeah, that would be it. Um, okay, so now we have, I mean, we answered the question, which is how much the egg slowed me down. It's like 0.31 meters per second. Uh, and then to kind of just summarize conceptually what happens is that, again, the eggs have some small amount of momentum moving toward me, They're like in the opposite direction of mine. We collide, so they give me some of their momentum, which, is opposite mine, so that shrinks my velocity a bit. And I give them an equal and opposite amount of momentum, which just happens to be enough to reverse them. And at the end, we're all moving at the same speed. Um, and again, if you like look back there, if those V finals weren't the same, and they didn't stick together, we would have two unknowns and one equation. So we would need more information. Um, and if you look back at the equations or at the problems you've been solving so far, you always have some information about the final state. Um, and so this is just another way we can do that instead of saying like afterwards I was moving at this speed or something like that. Okay, so this leads well into our next little add-on topic for collisions, um, which is looking at the kinetic energy uh, of what happens when things collide. So let's do it for this one. Let's look at my initial kinetic energy and my final kinetic energy and see if it, if it changes. So now instead of kinetic energy density, we're just back to normal kinetic energy where we have mass instead of the density. 
And so to find my initial kinetic energy, I just add up mine plus the eggs. And so kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, where v is the speed, or like the magnitude of velocity. So it doesn't matter what direction. Um, and likewise, when you have components, you need to turn them into a magnitude in order to plug in to the kinetic energy. There's no x kinetic energy and y kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, or energy in general, is a scalar. It doesn't have a direction. So yeah, always plug in magnitude for kinetic energy. So we can do that. My initial 5 meters per second, the egg's initial negative 20 meters per second, and the negative 20 gets squared. So it becomes positive, and we get some initial kinetic energy of 900 joules. Great. Um, but let's see how that, if it, and how it changes. So let's do the same for final. Kinetic energy final is, again, the sum of my final kinetic energy and the eggs. Now we have these two new final speeds, this 4.69 that we calculated. And we solve to find that the kinetic energy is not the same. It's reduced by over 200 joules. So yeah, our kinetic energy decreases. And this is called an inelastic collision, when our kinetic energy decreases uh, after, like, during a collision. So where does that energy go? How is that possible? Like, I know ener like, energy is conserved. We can't create or destroy it. How, what can happen to energy? What happened in, in fluid circuits? Kinetic energy could change in fluid circuits, but what happened alongside of any change in kinetic energy? We have a change in pressure, right? Or potential energy, or some other energy density system. So total energy is conserved, but it can change forms. Just like I can hold something above the Earth with a certain potential energy density, and I drop it, and it's going to speed up and fall toward the Earth, pick up kinetic energy, but its potential energy then from the height is going to decrease. So what types of energy do you think kinetic energy can turn into during a collision? Well, here's a collision. I'm just going to drop my phone on the counter. What, what happened? Like, what, where could energy have gone? Yeah, sound. You all heard the collision. That sound is like a pressure wave in air. It takes energy to, to move the air. That's one thing. Things also heat up a lot of times when they collide. Like, if you play tennis or something like that and, like, feel the ball after a long time of playing, the ball will be warmer than when you started. Cars that crash, like, and crumple, like, gets really hot. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of different places that the energy can be transferred into from kinetic energy. Um, so we still are obeying physical laws. Uh, it's just kinetic doesn't have to be conserved alone. So the counterpart to elastic, inelastic collision, sorry, is elastic, which is, of course, just when kinetic energy is conserved. Um, and so in general, the way we check is just we, we calculate them before and after, compare them if they're the same, elastic if they're not, inelastic. That's pretty much as complicated as it gets. Uh, but just to explore a little bit more of it, um, something can be perf a collision can be perfectly elastic, and that's well, I mean, that just means that the kinetic energy is conserved. So elastic and perfectly elastic are pretty much the same thing. But something can also be perfectly inelastic, and that's meaning it loses the maximum amount of kinetic energy possible, um, right? So if, like in that last example, we had 900 joules to start with. And then we reduced to whatever, 670, something like that. And they stuck together. So I, you, we won't prove this together, but you can prove that when things stick together, that is the maximum amount of kinetic energy that you can lose. A very simple example of this, I have a ball of Play-Doh. I throw it at the wall. It's going to stick and stop. Kinetic energy has gone to whatever it was down all the way to zero. That's the maximum drop that can happen um, from a collision. Um, but things, you know, things can be somewhere in between, too. We can lose a little bit. Like a, if I had a rubber ball and I dropped it on the ground here, it's going to bounce pretty much all the way back up to where I dropped it from, but not quite, because we will have lost some energy to sound. Deforming the ball doesn't, isn't like perfectly elastic and stuff like that. But you know, there's somewhere in between. So things can be generally elastic, where it is conserved, or inelastic, where it's and kinetic energy is not conserved, but there is a limit to how much kinetic energy you can lose. And you reach that perfectly elastic when they stick together. So the practical implication of that is 
if in a collision problem things bounce off, you have to ev evaluate. You have to find kinetic energy initial, find final, see if they're the same. If you're told they stick together and you're not asked for any more information, just is it inelastic or elastic, you can say without a doubt that it is inelastic. Um, okay, any questions about this one? Let's do a practice. Uh, we have a piece of space garbage that's initially moving with the velocity zero, five meters per second, so straight up, and then it bounces off the moon. The moon not reacting just means like it doesn't move at all, so essentially consider the moon as an external force. So we don't care about how much the moon recoils. It's gonna be minimal, and after the collision, the object is moving with a new velocity that is to the right and down. So it bounces off the moon and turns around. And the questions are, is this elastic, and is, is momentum conserved? Give you 15 more seconds. Okay, so first uh, from the kinetic energy side of things, is it elastic or inelastic? We, so the answer is B, we'll walk through it though. Just plugging in initial kinetic energy, the speed is easy, the velocity is only in one direction, so we can just plug in five meters per second. For the final velocity, I have components three, negative four, and like I said, we can't use them individually. We need to combine them to find the magnitude of the velocity or the speed, which I've done here, and if you do that, you find that the magnitude of the speed is still five meters per second. So the speed of the space garbage, despite it turning, does not change, and so our kinetic energy is conserved. So it is elastic. Uh, for momentum, this one I guess you could argue depending on what you involve in your system. But assuming the moon, like I said, is an external force, then we do have an external force. So we do have a delta P. And yeah, I mean, you can see since the velocity of the garbage changed that it does have a change in momentum. Um, and since that change in momentum was caused by something outside of our system, then you could say that momentum is not conserved. However, I'll give you, you know, if you said A, that's fine too. Just know that what that means is that you're including the moon in your system. And that's the moon and a piece of garbage collide. And so the garbage is gonna have this change in momentum, but the moon is going to have some equal and opposite change in momentum. The moon is probably a lot larger, and so it's gonna have an imperceptibly small velocity as a result. Uh, but yeah, you could say that, you could describe that as a closed system with two objects colliding. Um, so that part is a little more open to interpretation. Questions here? So now I have a couple demos for you before we wrap up. So this is one you've probably seen, if not in class, then in like popular culture. Uh, it's called a Newton's Cradle. And so we can use it to learn a little bit or demonstrate elastic and, or yeah, relatively elastic, but momentum and kinetic energy in collisions. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this ball, rise it, raise it up, and then let it hit the others. So first, I want you to put on your kinetic energy cap. So think about what's happening to kinetic energy here. Um, is it, how is it being changed, lost, transferred, whatever? Let's just think about that. Do it one more time.
All right. So do you think that this system is elastic or inelastic? Inelastic, yeah, it's relatively inelastic uh, for one reason or the other. Uh, yeah, I mean, we all hear it. That's one way the pool balls do like deform a little bit, but some energy is being absorbed here, and we can see that because the speed of the balls is, is decreasing, right? I mean, we're, this is a lot more than we're actually gonna prove in this class, but we can kind of just qualitatively see that when I first drop the ball, these are moving faster, at least when they are about to collide, and then as the amplitude decreases, they start to move slower. Another way to, to maybe prove that actually, which I, I think is true here, is that the, so if, we, if you just like close your eyes and listen to the clacks, the rate at which, until we get like very small and then weird things happen, the rate at which we hear the clacks, the frequency stays the same. But if you look, you can see that the balls are moving less in that same time interval. So that's one way to prove that they're slowing down. But they're slowing down, the kinetic energy is, is dissipating. So we have some degree of inelasticity here. Um, obviously not perfectly inelastic because it keeps bouncing a bit um, and some of the kinetic energy stays. But after you know, many, many collisions, we lose more and more. All right, now put on your momentum caps. So think about what's happening here from a momentum perspective. I want you to, so whatever thoughts you have, we'll do it one more time, but pay attention to the balls in the middle. Like what, what's, what are they starting at? What are they ending at? Like what's happening, not to the ones on the end, but the, the mass of them. You notice at first they're, they're all still, but after a while they start all moving together back and forth. And what this actually is, is a demonstration, I think, of conservation of momentum. Because, so there's ways to dissipate kinetic energy every time they collide, right? They clack and whatever. So we know that energy has a way to, to get out. But for momentum, momentum is, is just conserved. We can't like, there's no like momentum conserving and non-momentum conserving. If we lose momentum, it's because it's being transferred into something else. So this is a cart on wheels. This can technically slide a little bit. There's tiny little ways where, these, where this system can offload momentum and it will eventually, everything will come to a stop. But very roughly, momentum is conserved. And that's why even as the amplitude and the speed of these balls decrease, we maintain this overall movement of this big mass of them, where now they're moving very slowly, however, all of them are moving, and so the total momentum is staying relatively the same. And so that's just an, a, an example of how you know, kinetic energy can be lost, and we can have very inelastic collisions and still conserve momentum. Okay, so that's kind of a fun one. This second one is really something that you've already seen. We'll just kind of work through together. This one, I was having problems with it in the last lecture, but there, you have these in DL, they're just, most of them are broken and defaced. So this is like the one clean one that we have. Um, but I have it arranged so that this will be, well, let me ask you, do you think I'm gonna make a collision happen? These two have equal mass, I'll tell you that. There's no mass on either of them. So tell me whether you think this collision was elastic or inelastic. What do you think, I'll run it again. Oh, see. Elastic or inelastic, what do we think? Elastic. It's elastic. Uh, and the way we can tell that is roughly like looking at the speeds where when, this, when these two collide, this one comes to a stop. And this one keeps going at about the speed that this one originally had. And so if they have the same mass, we're just, we have all the momentum in this cart transferred to all the momentum in this cart transferred back. And so, yeah, the speeds stay roughly the same, kinetic energy is conserved. Let's flip this one around and now we should get a more, if not completely inelastic collision. Yeah, and now you can see the, 
total speed or the speed of both of these, they stuck together. The speed has gone down, momentum has decreased. Uh, or sorry, the momentum has not decreased because the, I mean, can't be. Um, but the kinetic energy has decreased because the speed went down. And one way we can like think about this is very, like from a maybe mathematical reasoning perspective, is that when you have momentum being conserved, and let's, uh, let's just still talk about two carts with equal mass, right? So this has mass m, this has mass m. When these two carts collide, no matter like what happens, we started with a mass mv, or sorry, momentum mv, right, of this one, and then when they collide, assuming there's no external force, we still have momentum mv. So really what that's saying is that the velocity of these two, whatever it is, has to add up to our original v. Does that make sense? We have one cart stopped, one cart moving at speed v, and then afterwards they still both have mass m, and so just the total momentum staying the same means that the sum of the velocities has to stay at v. So the maximum amount of kinetic energy that we can have after that turns out to be if one of them stays, like becomes still, and the other keeps going with speed v. Because if you split a number up anyway, so let's say I have the number five, if I take four and one, or two and three, or yeah, I mean, that's, I guess that's all you can do really. Uh, the sum of those squares, in other words, like calculating the kinetic energy, right, because we do one half mv squared plus one half mv squared, two squared plus three squared is smaller than five squared. Four squared plus one squared is smaller than five squared. The only thing, the, the best you can do is come exactly equal to it, like five squared plus zero squared equals five squared. And you could do that with any number, like whatever number you start with, if you split a velocity into two parts, which is a, like, that's our momentum conservation, saying that our total momentum, which is just the sum, has to stay the same. Then if you take the sum of the squares of those two pieces, now we're talking about kinetic energy, the sum of those squares is always going to be less than the square of just the total itself. So if that doesn't make any sense, it's not that important to like remember, that's fine. But just like, just, I would, urge you to just like take out a pen and, pen and paper at some point and just like kind of doodle around with this and see like what it means. Why kinetic energy doesn't have to be conserved when momentum does. And, it, and also why kinetic energy will never increase after a collision, assuming you don't have an external force. So just food for thought. Um, I'll see you next week, which apparently we do not have a quiz until the 23rd. Have a good week. <laughs>